Dear Senators, staff members, students, stakeholders, and our shareholders, good morning. It gives me a great pleasure this morning to talk to you about the Engaged University. Of course, I would have liked to speak this in person uh, as we sit in our different lecture halls, but under the circumstances, I also have the pleasure to speak to you online. I would like to say that I will be taking questions, uh, so feel free to put down your questions uh, as you, uh, as I proceed with my uh, speech today. I'll be talking to you about the engaged university. Now, imagine if you were to see a flock of birds, one distinction that you will realize is the behavior of an eagle, uh, of an eagle as opposed to other pass the storm in a higher uh, place where they can seek peace and security but also have a new perspective about the direction of the storm uh, and what they could do uh, about it. I'm saying this for us also to imagine Yunam as that eagle in that storm. As we know, uh, the economic climate uh, currently is challenging. And we need to embrace and take that position of an eagle that will take the direction and face the storm, and knowing that the storm is dangerous, but that uh, through embracing the energies and the potential and competencies that we have as an institution, we will use the currents of the storm uh, to fearlessly move forward and achieve. Now, why am I having this address? This is in terms of section 14 uh, of the University Act, which uh, gives us the opportunity uh, to meet uh, as members of the Senate, as well as the students uh, and the academic staff, as well as administrative. The aim is really to address the university community about where the university is and where it is heading. And it's in that context that I will be speaking uh, this morning. I would like us to remember that this university has been in existence for some time. And when His Excellency uh, Dr. Sam Nyoma uh, was inaugurated as the first founding chancellor of the University of Namibia, said the following. I see the University of Namibia as a center of higher learning, saved by dedicated men and women, of quality and producing graduates determined to uplift the standards of living of our people. I see the University of Namibia taking its rightful place in Southern Africa, in particular Africa in general and the world at large, and making its contribution in every area of the body of knowledge. This statement he made on the 23rd of April 1993. Now today we have to ask, are we fulfilling that dream? as a community, as an institution. And what I hope to uh, indicate to you today is that the university, through the, my predecessors and up to where we are, and, and taking into account the commitment of our students and staff over the years, we have been able to play that role. I wish just to remind you that the mandate of the University of Namibia is prescribed in terms of the University Act, Section 4 of that Act, which says, and I quote, is to provide higher education to undertake research, to advance and disseminate knowledge, to provide extension services, uh, to encourage the growth and nurturing of cultural expression with the within the context of the Namibian society 
and to further training and continuing education to contribute to the social and economic development of Namibia and to foster relationships with any person or institution, both nationally and internationally. This mandate we take very, very seriously uh, as management, but also as student and as council. The university is given that task to fulfill the human resources development of the country. Of course, we know that we are not the only one, there are other players, but we commit to play our part. Our vision is to be a sustainable international hub of excellency in higher education, training, research, and innovation by 2030. And we exist to contribute to the achievement of national and international development goals through the pursuit of translational research, quality training, and service. How do we achieve this vision? Uh, the vision of our government. In, if in the Vision 20 document, when you read it, you'll see it says very clearly and identif it identifies the higher education system as a whole, as the engine that must drive the achievement of Vision 2030. And it says we will have to transform ourselves into an innovative, knowledge-based society supported by a dynamic, responsive, and highly effective education and training system. Question is, are we that dynamic, responsive, and highly effective education and training system? You would recall that uh, uh, soon after independence, the government of Namibia made reforms to the education system. Those reforms were focused on four key pillars. And those pillars are as follows. One was democracy, equity, quality, and equality. Those four pillars are still very, very important uh, for the development of this country. And you will see, as I make my presentation about us being an engaged university, that we are speaking and responding uh, to those key pillars. There is no question about democracy because as an institution, we are committed to academic freedom. But freedom that does not become irresponsible. As I've said before in my inaugural speech, we have got to be a university that, yes, exercises its rights, but we are not to serve in opposition of anybody. We are a political organization, and we have to use evidence and science to inform our decisions and statements that we make. On the question of access, the University of Namibia transformed itself from a one campus system in, in, in Winduk to now 12 campuses across the country. This has been done to increase access to higher education to the masses uh, in this country and beyond. Where I believe as a higher education system we have challenges is in regard to equity and quality. But obviously, we are addressing these to the extent we can. And I'll demonstrate how we are doing that. Let me now speak to how we have carried out this mandate uh, in the last 10 years. The University of Namibia, through the stewardship uh, of our council, uh, and indeed the efforts and dedication of our management have made sure that the university's programs are responsive and relevant. As we speak today in the sphere of academic affairs, which is indeed headed our, by, by our Professor Gideon, the university has have more than 340 qualifications, uh, five of which are certificates, uh, 60 are diplomas, 159 are bachelor degrees, 74 masters and 37 PhDs across different fields. These programs are not existing to just pursue science. They are there to respond to the needs of this country based on the priorities that our government has set and in response to the SDGs that our government has also committed to. Now, 
how has the growth of our academic staff or our ad academic and administrative staff grown over the years to respond to this mission? You would realize that when we were established in 1992, we had less than 100 uh, academics and over 250 administrative support staff. This has grown over the years, and you see that uh, at this stage, uh, we have a lot more academics because of the programs that we have, and of course, uh, the number of our, our support staff has also increased. The result of this investment in the human resources that uh, take care of the quality production of skilled labor in the country has resulted in the university producing over 32,000 graduates in the last 10 years. What is significant about that, this particular uh, progress over the last 10 years is the number of female graduates uh, uh, across uh, the sphere of different programs. For example, in 2011, we had 1,855 female graduates as, to oppo as opposed to 1,141. And as of last year, we had more than 2,990 female graduates as opposed to 1,419 males. So the question of equality, as I indicated earlier, uh, we have made sure that the education system is indeed responding to the needs of empowerment of women and society in general. There is, of course, an, this is an area of concern because the question is, what is happening to the boy child? Where are they if they are not finding their way in universities? What is happening to their performance in secondary education? What are their interests? And this is an issue that our faculties have been examining and at the relevant stage we will release the results of that particular scenario. I also want to indicate to you over the years uh, how the graduation looks per region because as I indicated we are a public institution that is to serve the whole country. You will see from the, the, our statistics that across the, the, the regions we are doing relatively okay. The, there are, however, uh, uh, four regions where we have concerns, and that is Hardap, Karas, Omaheke, and Ochozonjupa. Uh, and we are examining this and see how, what we can do to increase the number of, of graduates coming from those regions. We need to be asking what is the what's the reason for this kind of performance? Is it as a result of investments that need to be made in those uh, particular regions? Is it the quality of training? Is it the infrastructure that is there? Or are there some other region, reasons that are causing this uh, perceived imbalance? But it is going to take all of us to focus and to really uh, encourage more learners from these regions to apply and be engaged uh, in the ed higher education system. Now, there has been a question about uh, what wh how does the graduate employability of the University of Namibia graduates looks like? Where do they go and where do they get employed? And is the education system contributing uh, to employment creation in this country? If you look at the st stressor studies, it would indicate that most of our graduates do indeed get jobs uh, and they, their performance uh, in those jobs is also to the satisfaction of our stakeholders. But what I want to highlight here is the importance of everybody, every youth in this country pursuing higher education. Why is that important? You would see from this, and this is according to the National Statistics Agency uh, data of 2019, which really shows that the higher your qualification, your higher education qualification, the more likely you are to be employed. And the lower your qualification, the higher the likelihood that you will be unemployed. So it is absolutely important that we all take effort 
in professional development and not just being satisfied with a certificate or a diploma, but pursuing higher degrees that will give us better skills to contribute to employment creation uh, in the country. Now, as we do that, as a university, it's very, very important for us to have a paradigm shift in how we perceive things. As I indicated earlier, like the eagle, we have to take, go through the storm and take a new perspective. Now, the truth is that more and more uh, technologies are being injected in the education system in the employer, in the labor systems, in the private sector, NGOs, public sector. You cannot function if you don't have digital skills and others that are required. And we'll see that there are, as we take more and more innovation in our systems, we no longer need certain jobs. Certain jobs become uh, obsolete. And as a university, it is important that we take that into account as we frame our curriculum, which I'll speak uh, to a little later. There are many jobs that have disappeared. Nobody trains uh, typists anymore. Nobody trains secretaries or drawing officers and, and telephone operators because these things are no longer needed. But there are also jobs that we have lost in your time and my time uh, where we don't anymore have uh, people who would be looking at uh, things like uh, 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 um, elevator operators because these can be computerized nobody has to stay there to operate it you computerize it and automate it and there you go but we have to take into account that there will also be jobs that will be lost uh, during our time uh, uh, and such jobs are already becoming uh, vulnerable like call centers personal bankers, personal assistants, answering services, drivers. We know vehicles are already uh, self-driving, and that's the future. Uh, so when we train, we need to keep this in mind. But it's, technology is not bad because it also creates new opportunities, enhances the job satisfaction, and opportunities in which skills uh, 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 can be used to change life and improve the livelihoods of people. The jobs to come, we would be looking at people who would, who would be looking at new materials, uh, sciences. Uh, as an example, people who work in mixing paints now, in the future, they may not be needed uh, because already in some of our research that we are working with our partners, we are looking at opportunities where paint could be self-healing. In other words, when your vehicle gets scratched in the bush when you are driving in your farm, it will self-heal. There will be no need for you to go back to for spraying. So those sprayers and those people who are mixing paints, their jobs become threatened. And it's an opportunity that technology provides to us, which we need to, to take into account. But you would agree with me, with more sophistication, more technologies, there is also a lot more complexities uh, in terms of how values and society behave. The whole thing about social media and the ethics and unprofessional conduct we see means we need people who can also train in wisdom, the so-called wisdom monitors. Uh, and we have to look at this as an institution to be able to, uh, be able to inform better decisions and policy making. There will be jobs uh, that would be looking at uh, uh, how we can use uh, genes or genome uh, uh, designers who would inform better decisions for for decision I mean for for personalized medicine uh, and we have to be looking at all different kinds of jobs that the future will provide uh, uh, and if we don't do that we are likely to remain irrelevant as an institution now let me speak to in this space what have we done around research innovation and development uh, as a university I will speak first about achievements. This year, as we know, uh, the whole country has been uh, affected by COVID-19. And as a university, we responded with support from Deb Marine. We created a COVID-19 diagnostics lab, which is licensed and accredited by the Minister of Health. Uh, through this lab, we have been able to uh, test 
and diagnose and provide accurate results of hundreds and hundreds of uh, samples. Uh, and for us, it is an achievement. And remember, it speaks to the vision that uh, our founding uh, chancellor indicated in 1993. We have also engaged uh, the Namibia Agronomic Board to see if we can create a, seed, a Namibia seed production facility uh, for this country. That research is ongoing. Uh, trial sites have been set uh, in partnership with NTA and AgribizDev. Uh, and we, are, we have started with testing uh, the different varieties um, and cultivars for seed production in this country. We all know that at the moment, all the seeds in this country, whether it is uh, horticulture or crops, all these we import. And it is absolutely important that as a country, we work towards self-sustainability and self-reliance uh, in the future. Precision agriculture is absolutely important as well. Uh, we have to move to a situation where uh, we use less water, less land, but high yields. And we're experimenting uh, with funding from Southern Africa Innovation Support Program, which is financed by the government of uh, Finland, in partnership with agripreneurs in uh, Swakop. Uh, and our students are being trained in precision farming uh, uh, and entrepreneurship. And we will make sure that we take advantage of, the, of our desert, that it, it, it be made also a food basket uh, of this country. We know our desert is not dead. It may look dead, but it's not. It is actually active and live, and it has nutrition, uh, and we can just do one or two things to improve its facility and grow crops. We have also worked um, uh, on uh, desalination of water. Uh, you may recall last year, around May, uh, our founding president uh, launched our desalination plant, which is 100% powered by solar. Uh, capable of producing or desalinating uh, 3,000 cubic meters of water, uh, 3,000 liters of water uh, uh, per hour. Uh, and we, along that, we have been able to plant olives. Uh, and recently, we also moved to ensure that that plant is desalinating water uh, from the sea. And I would like to show you, this is what we are bottling and you can contact us to order this. It's 100% seawater, which is now fresh water, and it is uh, oxygenated, which means its shelf life is much longer. And it's something that we would like to see um, uh, also expanded and diffused across the country. Also, at the request of the Minister of Agriculture uh, and uh, the Regional Governor of Zambezi, we were able to respond to the outbreak of the African migratory locusts this year, uh, in which we did surveillance, monitoring and modeling of the movement of those locusts uh, and, and be able to capture them, in which we are experimenting currently uh, to see if they can be processed as a poultry meal and fish meal. Uh, but we are also looking at what sort of pesticides could be used in future that would be more effective, but uh, uh, also uh, friendly to the ecosystem. We have moved into uh, animal feed from encroacher bush and scientific research on the nutritional benefits of feeding our small and large stock uh, using encroacher bush. Uh, we have also uh, won the Africa peer review mechanism uh, assessment uh, project in which we are doing a country self-assessment for Namibia. This is very important for us as a university because we will then be able to create capacity but at the same time also uh, have a frank look at how our country is doing as far as governance uh, is concerned. The Namibia integrated landscape approach for enhancing livelihood and environmental governance uh, project. We are working with the Minister of Environment, Forestry and Tourism in the United Nations uh, to make a study that will hopefully uh, give us a better picture of uh, other approaches we could use to improve livelihoods uh, in the different uh, parts of the country. We are also strengthening the protection and assistance to the stranded and vulnerable uh, uh, migrants in Namibia. 
with the support from the International Mi uh, Organization for Migration. And this is very important because we need to ensure that the people that are affected by forced migration are assisted, integrated and rehabilitated. Our School of Medicine has initiated a project to train, uh, I mean, our School of Veterinary Medicine has initiated a project also to train beagle dogs to detect COVID-19 in humans. And those experiments are also going very well and we are certain that in the future we would be able to uh, increase this and see what other diseases these dogs can be used to uh, uh, check. Now, we need to create an enabling environment for research to be more effective, to be advanced, and to have impact. Uh, so what we have done uh, is to decentralize uh, research ethics to school level. So now uh, you will no longer be required to wait for the university's overall research ethics team to be able to review your project uh, to, to get eth ethical clearance. That all now would be done at the schools and faculty levels. Uh, and we believe that would be more efficient and, um, uh, and ensure that people are not frustrated. The appeal mechanisms for research ethics have also been put in place uh, and it should be much, the turnaround time uh, is now less than uh, a month. Virtual doctoral writing seminars, uh, we have improved. As you know, we have a lot of postgraduate, uh, as part particularly PhD students, but our graduation levels have not been as high as we expect. Uh, and these virtual doctoral writing seminars are essential in ensuring that we, uh, we improve the capacity and competency of our doctoral students to be able to move much faster. Uh, we also have journals as a university, you may know, one in, in science, one in humanities, one in the language center, and others that the Faculty of Agriculture have been planning. So training has been provided to these editors of these journals to ensure that uh, these uh, uh, journals receive uh, international accreditation and ISBN. And our library has been very effective in supporting and providing uh, leadership on this initiative. We've also had uh, webinars on coping strategies of conducting research during COVID-19 outbreak to ensure that um, although we have this pandemic, we don't stop doing research. Uh, so there are other ways in which we can adapt and ensure we move. We have launched uh, 3D multi-interdisciplinary conference proceedings, uh, which uh, 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 looked at the, the various ways in which multidisciplinarity can contribute to development. And as I indicated earlier, our um, UNAM journals and special edition have now been indexed internationally, which means it has an OED number. Uh, now, initiatives to increase resource mobilization. What have we done? You will notice as I present later that uh, we are still uh, heavily subsidized by the government and we're quite grateful. But we still need to make effort also as an institution to ensure that we attract a lot more external resources from elsewhere. In order to do that, we have created a center for grants management and that office uh, through the PVC re uh, for research, Professor Peters. We have worked on grant proposal writing training for staff and we have been receiving support from our international partners that I will acknowledge later. Through this initiative between January and July this year, we have managed to get 26 million Namibian dollars from uh, grants uh, from external sources. And indeed, uh, COVID-19 lab, uh, which was a donation of 3.5 million, uh, also enables us to increase more resources and be able to uh, increase our competencies and capacities uh, for testing. Uh, the testing services have been ongoing to, uh, for the Namibia Institute of Pathology, Minister of Health, and the Chinese Embassy uh, through this lab. Uh, we have also considered that as a university, through our different faculties and campuses, we have different kinds of labs and these laboratories need to be shifted from just teaching labs to focus more to research and development as well as service labs. And for them to serve as uh, service labs, they need to be accredited 
and certified by the Namibia Standards Institution. And that process has started uh, and we are hoping that uh, through that accreditation process, once it's completed, these laboratories can then be used uh, as service labs for different uh, services that may be required, whether it is DNA sequencing or forensics or testing the, uh, the strength of materials or the quality of food or the toxicity levels, we would be able to do these things because we have those equipment and uh, the analytical capacity uh, the accreditation standards are, are followed. We are also working uh, uh, with the Institute of New Materials at, uh, at the University of Saarland in Germany uh, to see how can we use Namibian materials to promote cheaper housing. And that project is of, uh, it valued at 10 million uh, Namibian dollars. As I was speaking earlier, uh, this is what we are doing in the uh, at, uh, experimenting and see how we can make the desert uh, environment more um, more fertile for for crop production, uh, and we we are using this uh, composting uh, technology uh, here at Noidam, and anyone who wants to learn more can just contact us. Uh, this is the desalination plant I spoke about earlier. Uh, we have also a um, it took a lot of time uh, to investigate the possibilities of wind energy and we established and, uh, uh, and launched these three wind turbines in Luderitz mm -hmm. which are providing energy to a project of women that are suing uh, uh, governments in Luderitz. We do that to also support as just part of our corporate social responsibility as an institution. And indeed, we have been experimenting on the encroacher bush and we have been able to feed animals and see the impact that these have on meat quality. The initiatives to increase innovation and development, we have approved a number of policies that makes it now possible uh, for the institution uh, to commercialize its research uh, uh, outputs and outcomes. Uh, the innovation and commercialization policy and procedures have been approved by our council. Intellectual property rights policy and procedures have also been approved. The technical, analytical, nutritional results of specific produce, uh, we are now able to do that. And we would be launching some of these pro uh, uh, products in the near future. We have also had um, uh, 10 masters and PhD students uh, uh, trained in pitching business ideas. Uh, and they had the opportunity to present this to His Excellency on his birthday. In terms of administration and finance, which is headed by Dr. Pro, uh, Dr. Ellen Namila, we have also had uh, very good uh, uh, results uh, in that um, when COVID struck, we put together a, an, a team uh, of experts in epidemiology and environmental health who put together the protocols for our staff and students to follow in line with the regulations as uh, enacted by our government. We have also been able to disinfect all spaces within the university to ensure that when staff return, they are returning in a safe and secure environment. Uh, the dispensers, as you may have noticed in different places, are now fixed, uh, and all that has been meant to suppress the spread of the virus. More than 600 staff members were provided with uh, uh, subsidized internet devices to be able to work from home. And we continue to provide uh, that assistance for those staff members who may be vulnerable and we allow them to work from home. Um, our health center and multipurpose building at Dr. Hage Gengob campus has been completed. Uh, from the outside, we need, just need to do uh, equipment procurement and furniture and, and conclude a few things. But the building is ready for use and we are very grateful that uh, uh, we have that sort of facility. It houses radiography, uh, oral dentistry, uh, the dean's uh, offices and administrative staff uh, offices. And this is basically how it looks. 
the initiatives uh, that the office has undertaken. We have engaged MTC to see what we could do to increase uh, access for students uh, to have uh, access to e-learning materials for more affordable rates. And uh, we are grateful that uh, MTC agreed to do that to reduce the costs. Uh, we have been operating on a, a server that is, has been outside the university's uh, uh, control. Uh, but uh, uh, our Department of Information Communication Technologies, together with uh, Cordell, uh, have begun the migrating of such materials to an infrastructure that is now based uh, here. It means we have more control and we are able to designate uh, uh, the usage much better. Uh, we have also expanded our ICT infrastructure and two weeks ago we installed a new server uh, and this has been possible through support from uh, our Ministry of Higher Education Technology and Innovation through NSFAF uh, for us to expand our, our infrastructure and e-learning facilities and through this platform we would be able to provide support to other institutions of higher education uh, in the country. We have introduced counseling services for, for students and staff uh, around COVID uh, across the country. And that psychosocial support uh, has been provided adequately. And we have also extended it to our international students who were uh, stranded when the borders uh, were closed. Through UNAMK, we also uh, supported um, uh, the uh, homeless people. We provided more than 400 uh, mattresses and bed linen uh, and we have also been able to provide uh, other s forms of support to quarantine centers. UNAM is busy reviewing its cost structure uh, framework to develop uh, a way in which we can cost our programs. It's very very important that we know exactly what does it cost the university to produce a graduate. Whether that graduate is in medicine, or in dentistry, or in music, or in sociology. We need to know how do we cost this such that we are able to determine and make sure that our economies of scale are, are in balance and we are not um, running programs that are not viable from an economic point of view. This means the business processes needs to be reviewed and mapping of all steps and structures uh, that influence uh, how we do things, identification of uh, bottlenecks, inefficiencies, uh, and identifying solutions that will enable the university to transition to a much more sustainable uh, and effective institution. That process is ongoing. The issue of safety is important. We have seen uh, the scourge of uh, GBV in this country. Uh, and as a university, we have responded to that by creating an initiative of a safer and secure UNAM. Uh, and in that initiative, we have put a tender process uh, in place now that would ensure all our campuses uh, in a phased approach have CCTV and command centers to monitor what is going on uh, at the campuses. And this is important because we want to make sure that uh, all our staff and students and visitors of our campuses are secure and safe. Now, there are a number of other things that we have achieved, uh, achieved across the campuses. Uh, for example, at uh, Jose Eduardo Dos Santos campus, we have received a donation of approximately three million uh, for laboratory equipment from the uh, German Development Agency, GIZ, uh, and this would ensure that our teaching and learning uh, in the engineering field is effective and also uh, has uh, a focus on research. Uh, we also secured a software uh, uh, from Procon for designing roads and, and buildings, which was valued at 4.8 uh, million. And this will enhance the design thinking of our students uh, and indeed would lead to cost saving in the institution because we would want to use this uh, software as well in our planning of our capital projects uh, uh, as well. Um, I also want to just emphasize that uh, UNAM is very involved in the agriculture field. So our Gongo campus has continued with experimenting 
on rice, what sort of cultivars and varieties are high yielding? What sort of uh, varieties are resistant to drought? And I'm happy to say that through this kind of work, we have been able to increase uh, from 2.3 uh, tons per, per hectare uh, to 3.5 tons uh, per hectare in the 2020 harvest. We hope we can increase this uh, tonnage uh, per hectare to about 8 to 14 in a few years' time. We have also uh, been able to produce uh, products and add value to the rice and mahango that we produce at Ogongo. And we have a product uh, which is a combination or a blend of mahango and rice, which we call Olthima. Uh, and it is very tasty. If you wish to uh, have a, a taste of it, please do visit our Ogongo campus uh, and they will sell it to you. Uh, now, as of yesterday, uh, we also received funding of uh, 219,000 pounds from the Welsh Government through our partner uh, in uh, Cardiff University uh, for a forestation, uh, afforestation project. And the idea is to plant indigenous fruit trees uh, in the north. We have identi but identified uh, 100 hectares which we will fence uh, and plant and create an irrigation system for a variety of indigenous fruits. Uh, and as a result of that, also, we are going to be procuring a processing facility that we can process these different fruits, whether it's marola or embe or some other, uh, that would be able uh, to produce and add value. Uh, uh, to. But the main idea with this project is to increase um, the, the capacity of our environment to absorb carbon emissions. Uh, and so we would be looking at, at which of these plants are most effective in sequestration of carbon so that as a country we are able to also reduce uh, uh, carbon footprint uh, in, in the country. As far as uh, Rundu campus is concerned, you may recall that in 2011, when the University of Namibia uh, um, inherited campuses, there was only... Uh, I mean, former colleges of education, there was only one campus that had a PhD. Uh, the rest of them didn't. And now we have much more uh, uh, PhD holders at those campuses and even professors. And I'm just citing here an example of Rondo campus, which increased in the last 10 years from seven PhDs in 20, last year to 14 in 2020. It means the University of Namibia still remains very committed to um, staff development program uh, that we have established many, many years ago. I also just want to emphasize that uh, we are aware that there are some policies that uh, we have in place that are maybe not helping uh, in, in making the institution go to where it should be. And those policies have been revised. For example, we have revised the student extracurricular policy, the student and staff disability policy and procedures, student accommodation policies, uh, recruitment and appointments policy, promotion policies for administrative staff, as well as payroll, asset management, uh, and subsistence and travel policies. All these have been revised and most of them have been approved uh, by council. Now, some challenges. We have uh, ongoing projects uh, that have not been completed. And if they are completed, uh, maybe not necessarily on time. And it's for a variety of reasons. We have challenges as far as uh, uh, salary bill is concerned, and as well as the pay as you earn. Uh, delivery mode has been, uh, uh, UNAM has been able to uh, ensure that all of all of our students are saved online uh, but we have been uh, running out of space but uh, as a result of investments as I indicated two weeks ago we have a much bigger uh, server now and that problem has been solved technology is always technology dependent in other words if you have a technology it needs to depend on another form of technology to function more effectively and we, we are looking at how we can utilize our expertise uh, to ensure that our technologies are more effective 
and they are more in sync and uh, synchronized one another and more integrated uh, so that data is quick and we're able to run analytics uh, whenever we want to. Our staff development policy has been challenged uh, because we don't have much money, but we, we, we still want to encourage and ensure that all the staff uh, are on some form of staff development. Uh, and as a university, we have been exemplary, I believe, in the country on this staff development, although it is challenged now uh, because of lack of funds. I want to take a bit of time just to speak uh, uh, specifically about our response to COVID. Uh, we are proud to say that we have been able to manufacture uh, hand, san hand sanitizers. And I would like to, be, uh, to extend my appreciation to my colleagues, uh, Professor Tim Rainey, Mr. Noseb, uh, Mr. Evaristas, Professor Nikano, and others who have worked very hard to make sure that our sanitizer project is a success. Uh, our COVID-19 diagnostic labs, uh, Dr. Emmanuel Napolo, has been um, uh, absolutely stunning in ensuring that this lab works uh, and that it is delivering uh, precisely what is expected of our, of our stakeholders. Uh, we have also been challenged and requested by our line ministry when she established the high-level research task force on COVID-19 to provide leadership to this team. And we are happy that a variety of the different groups in this, um, um, in this uh, task force are working hard to find different kinds of solutions as far as uh, COVID-19 is concerned. We have been able to put together a proposal for a containerized mobile testing lab, uh, which has been financed by the, development, uh, the German Development Bank uh, to a tune of uh, more than 300,000 euros. The advantage with this uh, containerized lab is we are able to take it to anywhere where there is a pandemic and it's not just going to look at COVID. For now it's COVID, but it could be used for any other uh, outbreaks uh, on communicable diseases. And if it happens to be that we needed to put it at the border, we can take it there, whether it's at the airport or at the port, at the harbor, we can move that facility anytime and it is very advanced. We have invested in the expansion of IT infrastructure to ensure uh, that we contribute to universal access to internet and our students have uh, increased access to online materials. And we also, of course, launched a smart register system uh, as you enter our campuses. Just to, for your information, uh, the number of uh, COVID-19 cases in, at the University of Namibia has been a total of 93. Uh, of which uh, 67 uh, students and 26 uh, have been uh, staff members. Unfortunately, we lost one staff member, and for that I'd like to ask you to pause for a moment of silence in her honor. Thank you very much. Uh, now, these are the good news is what we have been able to achieve as a university over the times. But we have had challenges. We need to ask ourselves, for all these achievements that we have achieved, that 32,000 32, students that we have been able to graduate, what did it actually cost the university? Uh, uh, the efficiencies that we are running, the being able to put all 31,000 students online, what has it costed the university? In my view, it's the commitment of our government to support us through its subsidies, but also, most importantly, the commitment of our staff and students to always go beyond the call of duty. Uh, it is very heartwarming to know that staff members are willing to go beyond the call of duty whenever they are needed to do so. And during this COVID, it has been absolutely um, uh, uh, impressive to see the commitment that our staff members and students have made and we would not have been able to uh, to be where we are if it wasn't to your uh, commitment and I want to thank you you are the heroes uh, for being able to get us where we are now higher education costs it doesn't come cheap uh, now how is the University of Namibia funded our funding is prescribed in our act. In terms of section 23 of the Invest Act, 
uh, and I would like to quote it to you, the minister in consultation with the minister of finance may out of the monies appropriated by the National Assembly for the purposes grant subsidies to the university in respect of capital and normal recurrent expenditure of the university on the basis of principles mutually agreed upon by the minister, in other words, minister of higher education and the minister of finance and the university. And we, we have engaged our line ministry, the minister of finance, in regard to these principles, so that we have a, 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 a common understanding what are the principles that should guide uh, subsidies to the University of Namibia. And this process is ongoing, and we are very grateful that the government is uh, willing to hear our case. Now, I wanted to just give you a, a picture of how the subsidy has been looking like since we were established in 1992. A clear message is that the government has been uh, committed and consistent in its funding to the University of Namibia. From its inception in 1992 uh, to about 2015, the funding has been rising steadily. Since 2015, it started to go down. This is as a result, of course, of the uh, international economic climate uh, that we know uh, uh, and the effects that has been uh, seen uh, uh, as a result of this uh, uh, COVID-19. Now, one thing we need to keep in mind here is that uh, as this funding has been increasing, uh, uh, and so has been the costs of running the university. For your information, in 2010, we had 726 academics. But if I would give you the number of academic programs at the time, they were much lower. Now, as of 2020, we have 1,592 uh, academics, people who are teaching, and this, of course, includes part-time and adjuncts. This number has, you could say, doubled as a result of the programs that we have also uh, introduced. The new programs in, in medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, uh, veterinary medicine, engineering, and so on, has meant that we needed to in increase the number of academics. And so has been the number of supports, professional support staff. 2010, it was 502, and now we are talking about 859. So the total number of staff members is, is now 2,451, as opposed to what it was in 2010, which was 1,228. Meaning that the, the staffing costs have also increased from 307 million uh, to about 1.2 billion uh, this year. We didn't just increase the, the number of support and academic staff for, for its own sake. We increased that because also the, the enrollment, student enrollment also increased from 12,496 in 2010 to more than 30,000 this year. Some of our faculty, uh, like Faculty of Education, which has uh, 13,000 or 14,000 students, it's bigger than some institutions uh, in this country. So we've got to understand that the funding bill of the university is in that context. We also operate from 12 campuses across the country uh, where we have to pay water and electricity, uh, vehicles must run, labs must run, and so on. So that's the context within which this funding is. Now, if you compare to the slide uh, indicated uh, regarding the subsidy to what it is uh, currently, you would see that our subsidy in 2010 was 274, and currently it is 900. In fact, after the midterm review uh, last month, it was reduced to 840 meaning we have a very serious uh, deficit as an institution. And we need to take into account how do we survive this storm. We need to embrace the eagle spirit to face the storm. 
the university um, expects in its budget uh, to have more or less uh, uh, 1.7 billion uh, income. But this income is affected by the fact that uh, tuition fees are not coming as they should be uh, as a result of the funding difficulties that NSFAF and families uh, are encountering, which results in the fact that we have a deficit of 674 million. And when you take into all other um, accounts and do some adjustments, you would find that our deficit is 497 million. This is a lot of money, uh, which basically means the university needs to relook how could it function within its means. Um, and just to give you an impression, between now and March, the university will need uh, approximately 700 million to be able to uh, meet its obligations. Uh, but if you take into the current account the current circumstances, it means we will have a, a shortfall cash wise of 532 million uh, over the years. I mean, over the next months. And we have engaged uh, our Ministry uh, of Higher Education and the Ministry of uh, Finance and the Office of the Prime Minister regarding this situation. Uh, and to be just open, because our, our values, one of our values is transparency, and I want to indicate to you that how a typical month looks like uh, currently. We receive a, a subsidy of 75 million from the government and we collect 3 million from private students. We don't always get what we should get from NSFAF per month. So that gives you a cash injection monthly of about 78 million. Now our costs, if you take salaries, or operational expenses and our capital uh, projects, we have uh, expenses of about 136 million monthly which gives us a 58 million uh, cash deficit per month. And it, it brings a very big challenge now. Add this together and, and keep in mind the fact that our subsidy is only 880 million. It means we have got to do something. Now, to give you more information, you will see that uh, our staffing costs and our enrollment are very high. Uh, and our, uh, the subsidy as compared to the income or ex the total costs is like a Caesar that is eating each other. And it is important that we as a university don't just look at this and say, what can we do? This is now a problem. We need to close the university. We cannot close the university. We must find innovative ways in which we can address uh, this situation. This is the context why we initiated the review of the restructuring. Now, I want to be clear here that the university did a restructuring exercise in 2015. And in 2015, our subsidy at the time was 1.1 billion. That's the cash we were receiving from the state. And that, that restructuring exercise uh, led to us to have different positions in different faculties and different campuses. Uh, it is when we started to have assistant pro vice chancellors as opposed to campus directors. And many other things that happened at the time. Uh, and it's because we were able to afford it. As of now, our subsidy is 840, not 1.1. And our staffing and student numbers are much higher than what they were now. And that's why we saw it fit as management that we need to review the structure and see how could we live within our means. Without causing job losses or affecting the efficiency of the organization. 
The restructuring uh, started in August 2018. It was composed of academics and members of the union Nanto and Napu. Did, they did consultations and make, made pro, uh, proposals which were considered and approved by council in September last year. This year we were supposed to implement that structure. But when we realized that our funding situation is not good, we thought it is important and responsible that we don't just implement an organization uh, structure that we know we cannot afford. I want to repeat, it was important that we don't take irresponsible decisions by implementing a structure that we know we cannot afford. So we initiated a review of that structure that was approved by council uh, last year. And this review uh, made that we needed to consult faculty deans, directors, different structures of the university to consult and seek their understanding and wisdom on how best can we rescue the situation. In addition, this also meant we consult also our, our ministry, the Ministry of Finance and the Office of the Prime Minister regarding the dilemma we find ourselves in. The bottom line of these consultations or maybe before I go to the bottom line, is to say through these exercises, we got to understand better of how much does it cost us to run a particular faculty? How much does it cost us to produce a graduate? According to the figures that have been provided to me, it is very expensive and that is the nature of higher education you check world bank standards they will tell you that higher education is expensive 70 percent of of the operational costs in higher education would be on human resources because we are in the business of training and this has meant that if you look at medicine we currently charge around about 95,000 per student per year. But the actual cost of what it costs the university is nearly 300,000 per student per year. It's even more expensive in dentistry, even more expensive in veterinary medicine, and so on. So we made these consultations. The bottom line is the current financial climate does not enable our government to increase subsidy to the university. So what do we do in a circumstance like that? We have to reflect and see what we can do as a responsible organization. And so what we have done is the following. And this has been approved uh, by Senate, uh, by uh, Council as recommended by Senate. We are reducing our faculties from eight to four by merging uh, existing faculties. The Faculty of uh, Science, Faculty of Agriculture, and Faculty of Engineering merge into one. Faculty of Education and Faculty of Humanities merge into one faculty. Faculty of Law and Faculty of Economics merge into one faculty, and the Faculty of Health Sciences remain as is. So we have four faculties. From those faculties, the, the structure that was approved by Council last year uh, had approved 19 schools. And after this review, we have reduced those schools to 14. Uh, we had 84 departments and we have reduced those departments to 50. Uh, academic support units, we had five. We have reduced that to one. And uh, research units, there were six, and we have integrated those into two. The ag administrative wings, we have merged and created synergy to make sure that they are clearly supporting uh, the mission and vision of the institution. 
We have also considered relocating educational services from all the regional centers to the nearest campuses. In other words, where we have a, a regional center in a region and a campus, those services would no longer be provided at the regional center, but at a campus. Uh, and we're taking advantage of our online platforms and, and, and uh, infrastructure to provide even better services to the students. Uh, these changes means, of course, people will need to be redeployed uh, and VCMC will make such decisions on, based on a, a good fit uh, in terms of skills and competencies. Uh, it is still remains the university's aim to cluster and consolidate campuses in the long term. In other words, uh, we are considering in the future to have campuses, say all four campuses in the north, would be consolidated into a college and run uh, on that basis. We know that this is good practice uh, from other institutions, but that is something that uh, we still have to plan better for, and at the right time with resources, we will introduce such. The main aim of this uh, restructuring review is to flatten management structures and reduce hierarchy and bureaucracy. The proposal uh, which has been approved, or what it will be is that we will have four executive deans and these deans will be tasked to run faculties as business units. In other words, they will be responsible for effective management of those uh, faculties, for resource mobilization in those faculties, for uh, effective and adequate support to students uh, in those faculties and they will ensure that the people that are rec recruited in those faculties are recruited on time and they are competent enough to save in the specific skills that they will, uh, skills and disciplines that they will be uh, needed. We have also uh, reduced the number of APVCs from 11, that is currently, to five campus directors. The other uh, uh, campuses will be run by uh, executive deans. So Katima Mulilo, Ogongo, Rundu, and Southern Campus will be run by campus directors, uh, including Ifike Punya Pahamba and Oshakati. Oshakati and Ifike Punya Pahamba will be uh, managed by one, ex one campus director because of the proximity uh, and other logistics that we have considered. Jade's campus, because it's one program, will be run by an associate dean. Komasdal and Noidam will be managed by executive deans. It is important that we, we understand this uh, uh, clearly. Campuses uh, that will be run by executive deans will have support mechanisms for academic programs under those faculties. And the support structures we are putting in place will ensure the success of those programs. Where we have campuses that will be run by campus directors, uh, we will have academic uh, heads of department that will oversee the efficient running of those programs that are on those campuses. Obviously, we are also reviewing policies that affect the efficiency in the institution and we continue to do program viability audit and sustainability of our academic programs. The idea is to initiate business processes uh, re-engineering to make sure we don't do business in the same way. We are also introducing further cost cutting, cost, further cost -cutting measures, uh, which means uh, all vacancies will be frozen uh, provided that uh, operations allow. Of course, where there is dire need, uh, provided there is a motivation for it, we will recruit. But all other pro uh, positions will be frozen. 
There will be no appointments of part-timers or relief staff unless it is absolutely necessary. And we have done an analysis of this and know that sometimes it's not absolutely necessary. No overtime payments except for those performing essential duties and those who are working on shifts. Uh, we would freeze new academic programs unless it's externally uh, funded. Uh, there will be no new capital projects uh, uh, unless they are externally funded. And there will be no extra responsibility allowance. In other words, if you are asked to oversee or teach another model, we will not pay extra for that. Unless you would be able to prove that you have gone beyond your research time and your community service time. Just going beyond your teaching workload time and you are not exceeding your research time and your community service time doesn't mean we should pay extra. And we need to understand this. It doesn't happen in professional support. The fact that there is an additional model should not mean always an additional allowance. We don't do that in administration. When we increase the number of campuses or we increase the number of assets, we don't pay extra to our administrative support. We need to understand that. There will also be uh, travel will be limited unless it's absolutely necessary and we need to apply prudency measures we need to apply prudency measures for uh, our systems to make sure that uh, we need to make sure that uh, our system works uh, and uh, and we utilize resources uh, much better. In other words, if you need to print, consider whether is it really, really necessary for you to print. Can we do other, can we, can you carry out that exercise in some other manner? If you need to have a, a meeting, you don't have to drive to another campus, utilize. If you need to make a phone call, maybe use Zoom, use Skype or some other rather than using the landline. It is absolutely important that we be exercise prudency in the utilization of UNAM resources. Going forward, uh, restructuring is expected to give us a savings of 27 million, uh, 488,000. We don't expect this exercise to cause retrenchment or salary reductions. Those are not expected. And as I indicated to you earlier, we have cash inflows of 78 million per month, but our actual cost is about 136 per month. If we don't take these restructuring steps that the council has approved, it means we would not be able to pay salaries someday, or we will have to retrench. And as, res as responsible management, we decided to see what we can do internally to live within our means and create these savings to be able to ensure that the institution can still run effectively. So no retrenchment and no reductions in salaries. How does that happen, you may ask? We have re reduced the number of administrative and academic leadership positions to a minimum that is good fit. The administrative staff, we normally used to call such, but I would like to tell you today that we will no longer be using that term. All academic st uh, administrative staff will now be called professional support staff. And when we emphasize professional, we really expect that the services that would be provided to academics and other units would be professional, not just administrative, but that they would be professional in your conduct, 
in, 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 in the efficiency that you, you, you bring to the system, uh, in ensuring that things are done on time, uh, all processes that are really, really professional. I want to emphasize that it is professional. We are not just l changing a label, but it comes with the expectation that we need to be professional. We will commence with skills audit uh, and we will start with three departments, uh, I believe before the end of this year or early next year, to do skills audit so that we understand better what skills are required in this particular de uh, department. And we will be doing this per directorate over the years, that we ensure the people who are there are skills fit, they are best fit to be there. And those that are not, we would be moving them somewhere else where they are fit to function. This is meant to assist in improving efficiency and effectiveness of the organization. We will also be enabling the, the creating an enabling environment to make sure that we allow our, our academic staff to fully deploy their competencies. In other words, it's no point for us to expect some academics to ex um, attract extra grants if they have no support on the management of those grants, if they have no support in uh, planning and as commercial farms, not currently where they are only used for training. We would still ensure training still takes place in the commercial settings so that our students understand entrepreneurship and the essence of running agricultural businesses. Performance management system. I know this can be scary, but performance management is not meant to punish people. It is meant to improve and manage productivity in an organization. So this will be launched first week of December. We will launch performance management and it will begin with us in the executive. And with time, it will cascade it down uh, to different levels. But we will have this in place and please adjust your, 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 your mindset around performance. It's not just about whips or about bonuses. It's about productivity and ensuring that we account for time, we are productive in, uh, in, uh, in the processes we, uh, we undertake, the targets that we set, we achieve them. And if we can't achieve those targets, we explain and the necessary support is provided to make sure those targets are indeed achieved. Now, <coughs> a few weeks ago, we had adverts uh, for, the ex for the leadership of campuses and deans. That uh, uh, advert we withdrew, and the reason why we withdrew was to enable the review of the restructuring to be concluded. Now that it has been concluded, uh, I would like to say that those uh, positions of campus directors and executive deans would be advertised. Now, you all know that the, the deans, APVCs and director positions, at least in academic sphere, will end 31st of December this year. If we want to have new deans and directors by 1st January, we don't have time if we are to stick to 
uh, appropriate recruitment regimes. So with exceptions, the current leadership term of office will be extended for a period of four to five months. If you wish to continue, we will have those discussions in which APVCs and directors' terms will be extended until end of May to allow uh, recruitment processes to be done effectively. Once the recruitment is done, we want to do training for all the leaders. So job adverts for campus directors, executive deans and directors will, will, will be done. Once they are recruited, then they will be participating in the processes that recruits the assistant directors, the associate deans. Once that is completed, those associate deans would be in the, pro in the participating in the process of recruiting the heads of department. That's how it's going to run. We want a more fit for purpose uh, professional sub uh, support uh, to be deployed in the faculties and in the centers. And as I indicated uh, earlier, performance management will be launched uh, and it is also part of these processes uh, that will be ongoing. I want to sp spend a bit more time to talk about our partners. The University of Namibia sees uh, partnerships uh, as strategic in enabling us to achieve our goals and targets. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the partners that we have uh, had the privilege of working with in supporting various missions, various key performance areas, and various strategic objectives of the institution. These partners, I would like you to know they are essential they play an important role in not just uh, providing resources, but also enabling our students to gain skills by allowing them to be placed in their organizations and supervising them, ensuring that their graduate attributes that we expect them to achieve are, are indeed achieved. While on this, I want to speak uh, also to say as a university we are not any more so interested in general partnerships the public private partnerships we are particularly interested in product development partnerships in other words there must be a specific cause to which we want to achieve which would lead to a tangible thing, uh, whether it's in terms of innovation as processes or innovation as products. Uh, and it is absolutely important that we embrace these partners as an, as an institution. Our international partners we have the privilege to work with more than 200 different universities. And here I just sampled some of them that have been able, enabled us to achieve a greater amount of efficiency and achieving our objectives. I want to mention just some of them. Uh, Cardiff University, we, through the Phoenix Project, we have been able to achieve a number of, of um, key objectives in the institution, whether it is in regard to training of staff or provision of uh, opportunities for students abroad uh, and so on. And indeed, as I indicated, we have this uh, afforestation project. University of Turku has also supported us in realizing the desalination plant that we have at the coast, which now we are able to uh, bottle water with extra support from the Royal uh, engineer society in the UK. The International Labor, uh, International Organization for Migration, we also partnered and we would be working with them to support uh, the work of my, uh, um, 
of people who have been forced uh, who have uh, experienced forced migration in terms of providing psychosocial support rehabilitation uh, and counseling we are a node of the united nations university our sanma campus uh, our sanma uh, center in some Nyoma campus uh, and we appreciate and uh, uh, and really truly want to put it on record that we had the privilege this year of having the Under Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, who is also a director of that university, visiting us. Overall, we appreciate our partnerships. As I approach conclusion, I just want to say uh, we also take our presence in social media important. And we've been doing some analysis on the good things and the bad things that we appear on social media over. Uh, and the different uh, items that uh, are covered uh, under different uh, uh, social media platforms. In January, it was mostly the student enabler and the final marks missing and so on. So it is important that we pay attention that that doesn't happen again. Uh, in February, uh, the issue of final marks continued uh, and payment uh, not being uh, reflecting on people so the people had difficulties in registering. And again, we have to make sure we plan for these things and prevent them from happening next year, that students are really given the support they need and the service they require, uh, that they are not frustrated. In March, we had the lockdown come in and we had the challenges around three mobile devices, uh, module system, and uh, the others wanted the refunds and that didn't happen on time. Graduation information was missing and all those things. We have taken them into account and we are paying attention. April, the financial statements, uh, uh, there were some challenges. Uh, Ten mobile devices again. The online uh, learning platform uh, that we were introducing, it was new, and there were lots of challenges around that, but we took note, uh, and we were also happy to see that uh, inceptors through the sanitizers uh, packaging were also trending. Uh, May, uh, the portal access and the remedial classes uh, was trending. You may know that uh, we had about 6,000 uh, and, uh, 6, and a half, uh, 6 and a half thousand students that didn't have access to online. Uh, and so those students we brought back uh, uh, for face-to-face -face remedial teaching and we are very happy that they performed very well and they were able to move to uh, second semester. June and uh, the rest of the year, it's again uh, the issue of uh, results and online learning, the issue of NOIDAM demonstration uh, and UNAM case were all covered and we are paying particular attention. I just want to appeal the good things that you do, uh, put them on the uh, social media and show that what the university is able to do or is doing. In the print media, we have been covered uh, on a number of issues, uh, some good, some not so good. Uh, I can just point out that uh, in 2019, the Namibian newspaper, the one that covered us most, and this year it has been a new era that has covered us most. Uh, we are monitoring all these trends and we take uh, our media uh, colleagues and friends uh, as important partners in us conveying the message of education, of innovation, and uh, also of informing uh, policy making on the basis of evidence we generate uh, through research. Some of the images that came out uh, during uh, uh, the publications of different medias, the COVID lab, uh, the sniffing dogs, our desalination and bottling plant, as well as our UNAM case initiative uh, where we were uh, donating uh, to the quarantine facilities and so on. Let's not assume this country knows everything we do. We must engage 
the media, we must engage the stakeholders and make them aware of the competencies and capacities we have in the faculties and at the campuses. They will not know if we don't bring them to attention, these campuses and the capacities that we have across the country. For this reason, I would like to announce COVID permitting. Uh, next year, we are going to have meetings with regional governors in which we will indicate what the university, their university, is able to do for the regions in which we have a presence. In conclusion, I'd like us to remember that we are all here as a university, as individuals, as students, because of the talents we have. But it's not a right. There are other people who are also very talented, but they don't have the privilege to be here. So when we have a chance to be in a university, either as a staff or as a student, we must take that not just from a rights point of view, but also from a responsibility point of view. That when we are here, we are here to do something meaningful for this country. And we need to do that in a very serious manner. It means our talents must merge and be used as part of a team. That's when we become champions. If we want to push as individuals, we may be good. But if we push together as a team, we create impact. And that's what we desire. Also very important is that as a university, we are not here to just give skills. We are not just here to provide the knowledge that we have. We are here to learn and also build character of each other and that of the students. One of the things we must learn here is time management. Management of time, in my view, is essential and I'm speaking from experience that we, if we manage our time better, we would be able to free time for family, for other things. So find a way, whether you use the four quadrants of time or some other, that we become effective in managing our time. It increases productivity, which is what the institution desires. It is very critical. When this university was founded, it focused on teaching and consolidation and strengthening of systems. And that's what our dear uh, Honorable Professor Peter Kajavivi did for us. Solid foundation. Professor Hangula came in and he expanded access to edu higher education in the country. And this country is grateful. This university and my management is grateful to what Professor Gachavivi and Professor Hangula did for this university. We would not be where they are. Expansion of access and making sure that solid foundations were critical. Now we are emphasizing research and innovation and impact because we see innovation just doesn't just doesn't create value it frees us to be more creative to have more impact uh, uh, and to go beyond what we would otherwise expect uh, not to happen to challenge ourselves and this is really what we want the university to become more innovative more creative more impactful, more responsive, more relevant. So the state of our university is in our hands. Nobody else. Step by step, let us embrace 
the changes that we want to see happen. And we must change by the facts. The facts before us, we adjust to that. We can't stick to what the facts were before. We have to adjust as the facts unravel before us. Storms are opportunities for inventions and creativity. The challenges in life, you could think of any challenge. Whether it's the invention of a car, it was to conquer distance. Whether it's an invention of a washing machine, it was to conquer labor, intensive labor, especially for women. So we ask ourselves, this storm we are in now, what opportunity is it giving us? We should ask ourselves that question. Because every challenge that comes is an opportunity. But we must have a very clear view of who we are in our minds. Think again about a storm approaching and flocks of bed. What distinguishes an eagle from others is to face the storm. Knowing that once you reach a certain height, the current of that storm will enable you to quickly go through it and reach above and have a new perspective. We need to transform our minds and renew our hearts to be able to overcome the economic storm that we may be facing. Let's take this as an opportunity to change the university. It means let's not see ourselves as an organization just that just complains but is an organization that is going to do something about our situation and improve it better. So who are we? We are not ducks that flee. We are not ducks that just like that calmness, that calm environment. Accepting calmness makes us vulnerable. We would not have a sense of danger We would not be challenged to really show our talent. So let us embrace the spirit of the ego, which is rising in the storms to see greater things, to see potential in the storm, to see opportunity, and to be fearless in our conduct of science, research, and teaching. I also want to conclude by just quoting what Professor Pisaka Javivi said in 2003 in Cape Town when he spoke about at a meeting of vice chancellors, Sadiq vice chancellors. He said, and I quote, the need to innovate, to make commitments and the willingness to take unpopular approaches and even doing things differently in order to achieve desired goals is perhaps the greatest challenge of all. End of quote. And we are there now. Let's be brave to do so. But we must keep in mind also what Professor Hangula said. And I quote, The University of Namibia is not a Hangula project. It's a national project. And today I'm standing with, in front of you to also say, it's not a Matengu project. It's a national project. It is a public institution that must save the desires of the people of Namibia. And the responsibility is on all of us to deploy our skills, to respond to the priorities, to the challenges. We are not in the business of blaming. We are in the business of providing service. We are in the business of creating value. And that is why we have embarked on a curriculum transformation framework, which has identified 12 competencies and attributes that we expect our graduates to have. This framework has been approved yesterday by Senate and the process 
of revising the syllabuses and different curriculums of different degrees will begin next year. The whole of next year will be seized with this transformation because that curriculum prepares the University of Namibia and its conduct of research and its graduates for the fifth industrial revolution. We expect to have it complete by end of next year and for implementation in 2022 from January. I thank you. I will now take questions uh, to me uh, and I really thank you for your attention. In the vast openness of Namibia, a jewel shines bright. A space to fill your mind with progressive thought and a space for your brain to breathe. It's a place where the inquisitive thrive and the passionate pursue. Where you can realize things you thought you could only dream of. This place is the University of Namibia, offering you endless opportunities for endless possibilities.
Thank you once again. Um, we just had a commercial break. I will now take uh, and try and address the f four, or five, or six questions that were addressed. Uh, someone asked, can some students be allowed to continue online next year, even if registered for full-time mode? My understanding of this question is that uh, some students see the potential uh, that COVID-19 has opened up, that some degrees you can do fully online without having to come to class and have face-to-face -face teaching. This will have to be a decision of Senate, but I'm sure that we would have uh, different modes in which there will be those who are fully online and those that may be face-to-face. Uh, -face. But honestly speaking, we prefer a blended mode because it is more effective. Each system, whether it is fully online or face-to-face, -face, has weaknesses. So we prefer a blended mode. But this can be a matter that can be discussed and see. Uh, but certainly the increase in online full-time courses is something that we have already done, especially for all our diploma programs. They are already on fully online. So we embrace this change and the opportunity that uh, COVID has provided. More physical presence in Omaheque region, is that possible? I would like to report to you that in 2010, 2009-2010, we did an assessment of what the university could do in Omaheke, in Hardap, and Karas. And that study, after analysis and discussions, resulted in the creation of Southern Campus. We had very detailed full day discussion with stakeholders in Omaheke, in which we explored what is it that we can do there. In other words, as a university, we will not just come there because we need to come there. We have to look at what are the economic endowments of Omaheke. Can those endowments, uh, competencies that exist and opportunities, can they be fulfilled by being there or in proximity. And you know we have a presence in, in Hobabis and it's just 200 kilometers away from here. We are open to discussions with the stakeholders in, in Omaheke on what is it that we can do, provided it's affordable and viable. Those discussions we can have. Third question is, can tuition fees be lowered due to COVID-19? My answer is straightforward, no. Why? Because COVID also affects the university. Let me give an example. In the sciences fields, students have to do laboratory work. Students have to go on excursions. For them to do laboratory work, we have to buy the chemicals and reagents. We must make sure that there is water there and electricity. We must make sure that there is a technologist who needs to supervise that process, that it's done in a safe and quality way. The vehicles that needs to take these students to excursions needs to be fueled. A driver must be paid. The chemicals we buy for lab work, as a result of COVID, the prices have gone high. So if we lower the fees, where are we going to get the money to make sure you still get the quality of education you expect? 
we understand it af COVID affects the ability of parents and other stakeholders to finance. But we also want to provide that service with high care and high quality. And it must be something that we can afford. So let's just do all we can to make sure we have the money to be able to pay these fees. Number four, how is VC planning on dealing with the already high graduate unemployment from certain fields? How will intakes be balanced in certain fields of study in the future? As I indicated, we have a curriculum transformation framework which takes in, into account jobs that are obsolete, jobs that are likely to be obsolete, the professions that are threatened, and the professions that will emerge as a result of fourth and fifth industrial revolution. And the attributes, the graduate attributes that I said are in that transformation framework, there are 12 attributes. Let me just highlight some of them, which will be dedicated for the four-year period. They will be taught for the four-year period. It includes entrepreneurship, problems uh, solving and critical thinking, global responsibility, ethics, and so on. These, I am convinced, will contribute to lessening graduate unemploy uh, un unemployment. But I also want to appeal. You must always ask yourself when you plan to enroll in a profession. What is it that you intend to achieve with the knowledge and qualification you will attain? What is it that you want to do? What problems you want to solve? It's a different question if you tell yourself, I want to attain a qualification and become. Because becoming is a label you will attain. You will, attain. You will just be called an engineer or a fisheries biologist or a sociologist. But if you ask yourself as you undertake in this program, what is it that I want to solve with the skills that I'll attain in this program? You will define a problem and a solution to it, which you can then commodify. And that's what we expect the graduates to be thinking of. How do they make the knowledge they have tradable? The balance in certain fields, we are paying attention through a process of business intelligence. We, we are analyzing enrollments, progression rates, uh, tracer studies, all this data to see where are we over en enrolling as opposed to the labor demand and in which fields do we have scarcity and how do we support that better. So that balance is a discussion, uh, but it's certainly that we don't want to, to oversubscribe in certain professions. Number five, will UNAM accept grade 11 for admission next year? I know this is a topical issue. All I can say now is that we are very engaged with uh, different ministries on this issue because it is very serious and it has very, very severe implications. What I can only say, what is of interest to the University of Namibia is quality, improvement of quality higher education provision. And it is our understanding that the different reforms, the one that happened in 1992, 
The one that happened later in the 90s that introduced the NSSCO and this current one that has introduced the AS all are aimed at increasing quality, enhancing quality in higher education. So if people, through this enhancement, the AS is meant, and this is my understanding from the documents of the ministry, AS, the advanced subsidiary, is main, mainly aimed to enable students that graduate from that system to perform and be ready for university. So my question is, if that's the aim, why do we want them to exit at grade 11 and go to the university? So this is a discussion that is ongoing and we take it very seriously. That's all I can say about this. Number six, will restructuring affect growth for academic staff, uh, especially the lecturers, the transition from lecturer to senior lecturer, from senior lecturer to associate professor and so on? The answer is no it is not going to affect that. Academic growth, the transitioning from these levels of uh, an assistant lecturer, lecturer, is what we consider in academia as promotion. Because when you attend those levels, you attend them on the basis of a, a peer review mechanism that's quality assured, which is based also on external views and assessment of the competencies you have attained to reach those levels. The promotion to dean or director and all those, we don't consider that as academic promotion. It's just a, an admi administrative assignment. So it is absolutely important that even within this restructuring, you focus on improving your research competencies, you make sure you have targets for publications in peer-reviewed journals, in high-impact factor journals. Restructuring doesn't affect that, and we expect you to do well in your research so that as a university, we are able to increase our citation index and our ranking. I think these are the questions that I have received and I hope I have addressed them. Of course, you are welcome to continue to interact with us, with me, through our communication and through our Twitter pages and other social platforms. I thank you. And I In the vast openness of Namibia, a jewel shines bright. A space to fill your mind with progressive thought and a space for your brain to breathe. It's a place where the inquisitive thrive and the passionate pursue, where you can realize things you thought you could only dream of. This place is the universe. Uh, and enjoy uh, the break. Thank you. Of Namibia, offering you endless opportunities for endless possibilities.